going to go over here to my camera. Remember, these are the class notes that are under the class notebook in the content library. So our topic is perpendicular and angle bisectors. And our objective is that I will be able to use perpendicular and angle bisectors to find measures and distances. Also, there's a second part. I want to be able to write equations of perpendicular bisectors. And then we'll do that because um, we already did it in chapter one and then again in three. So at this point, I can't see your faces. So if you need to raise your hand, do it with the, the chat feature. Otherwise, I'm just going to go ahead and it's going to take us uh, kind of go a little quickly. So in chapter three, you learned that a perpendicular bisector of a line segment, if the line that is perpendicular to the segment is at its midpoint. And remember the word bisector means cut in two. Bi is two and sect is cut. So cuts in two makes sense. The only vocabulary new we have right now is equidistant. A point is equidistant from two figures when the point is the same distance from each figure. So we have this theorem we went over on Friday. I'll review it quickly. The perpendicular bisector theorem says in a plane, if a point lies on the perpendicular bisector of a segment, then it is equidistant from the end points. So what this means is CP is a perpendicular bisector. So these two are marked the same and this is perpendicular. And what it's saying is if C is some point on this line, any point, and, and this is a perpendicular bisector, then what it's saying is that AC is equal to BC. Wow. Amazing. So that's what the theorem says. Wow. Now we're going to do this little proof. Um, I'm going to try to incorporate chapter five on it and I'm instead of pausing to get your input each time since it's so much I'm just going to try to forge ahead and explain what I'm thinking. First of all, but don't you need to show your we're going to look at what is given to us. Okay. So CP is the perpendicular bisector of AB. So there's AB, here's the perpendicular, that of course is given. Now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use what was given to me. I was given a perpendicular bisector. Well, the first thing I notice is that perpendicular means I get those right angles. So I'm going to say um, the angle CPB and angle CPA are right angles. Perpendicular lines form right angles. Okay. That was a few chapters ago. The next thing I'm going to do is, again, I was used what I was given. So now I'm, I'm given a bisector. So a bisector gives me that AP is equal to BP. That is a definition of bisector. So look at my picture. I have the AP is equal to BP, so I have this now. I also have that these are right angles. And so those are, um, of course, let's see, those are congruent. I can say that those are congruent. And I know one of you would volunteer. It's because all right angles are congruent. 
So here's the thing. I'm looking at these two triangles here. I'm going to show that they're congruent. And I've always told you every time we do a proof like this, I say, you know what? If they have a side in common, use that. And they do. They have this side right here in common that is common to both triangles. So I'm going to say that CP is congruent to CP by the reflexive property of congruence. Now is when I want you to notice what all you have. You have a side here that's congruent to this side. You have an angle here that's congruent to this angle. And then you have this side that's congruent to the same side. So we can say that these triangles, CPB and CPA are congruent by the side angle side congruence theorem. Now that we know that those two triangles are the same, what I want to get to is that CA equals CB. So if these two are the same, then that means, I'm going to try to do this in blue, if I can find my blue, there's my blue, that this blue line is congruent to this blue line, and hopefully you remember that from, I think it's 5.5. So I can now say that AC is congruent to BC because corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. Woohoo! And then last but not least, we want to say that the measurements of those segments are the same. So AC is equal to BC. Remember this congruent sign means the shape is exactly the same, but an equal sign means the measurements are exactly the same. So if segments are congruent, then they are then they are equal. So any questions? Again, ask your questions if you have them. I know it was fairly quick. We're going to move on because we already went over that actually on Friday. This is just a little more formal. So now what we're going to do is the converse, which is exactly the opposite. Okay, in a plane, if a point is equidistant, from the endpoints of a segment, then it lies on the perpendicular bisector. So if you get this picture, it's saying if if D, if D is the same distance to the end points, meaning to A and B, so if DA is equal to DB, then that means D must lie on the perpendicular bisector. That's the only way that will happen. And so um, here would be your conclusion. Then D is on the perpendicular bisector. That's how that ha happens. It's the only way it can happen. So we're going to do a couple of examples here. I know that um, we already did a few on Friday. It should be fairly quick here. Let me zoom in just a little bit. See the numbers better? Okay, so find RS. If we know that this is the perpendicular and it's congruent by side angle side, then if this is 6.8, then this is 6.8. It's as simple as that. If we're going to look for AD, we have the same situation. Here's your bisected part. Here's your perpendicular. That means that CD is equal to AD. So we write... 3x plus 14 equals 5x. I'm going to take away both sides. The 3x, I'm going to divide both sides, and I get x equals 7. Now, I didn't answer the question yet because it said find AD. So the answer to the question is 5 times x. It's 5 times x. So AD is 35. Remember, always answer the question being asked. And then last, find EG. So we have another picture. 
where these two sides are the same, it's perpendicularly bisected. That means that if this is 9.5, then this is 9.5. But again, the question says find EG. So from E to G, it's 9.5 times 2. So EG is going to be 19. Okay. Again, I'm checking for questions. If you have one, put your hand up in the participants list. Okay, I don't see any. I'm going to turn the page over. Okay. And here we go. In chapter one, you learned that an angle bisector is a ray that divides an angle into two congruent adjacent angles. Remember, adjacent is where they share a side. So this angle here is adjacent to this angle here because they share a ray AD. You also learned that the distance from a point to a line is the length of the perpendicular segment from the point to the line, perpendicular. Now, in this figure to the right, AD is the bisector of BAC, and the distance from D to B, sorry, from point D to AB is DB, where this is perpendicular and same thing on this side. So again, that was from chapter one. And it's, it's sort of not self-explanatory, but it's, it's just like the other one. Okay. And again, it's going to be, if a point lies on the bisector of an angle, then it is equidistant from the two sides of the angle. So this is only slightly different. In other words, it means that BD is equal to CD. That's what that means. Okay. Now for right now, because of the interest of time, right now I'm going to skip this just for today. I may come back to it too tomorrow, and I may not if we're going to do more, but I'd prefer to get through the notes for sure, and if we can, we'll come back here. Okay. In the meantime, you have um, a converse of the angle bisector theorem. So it goes both ways. If a point is in the interior of an angle, so it has to be between, you know, BAC, it has to be somewhere in here. And it's equidistant from the two sides. So if you know BD is equal to CD here, then it lies on the perpendicular bisector. Sorry, not perpendicular. It lies on the bisector of the angle. I think that sounded funny. Okay, so that's the only way you can have that relationship where D is equidistant here and here. It's got to be there, which means if that's the case, then AD is the bisector. So you can use that. You can use this converse theorem to reach that conclusion. We'll do a couple of problems finding this example. If you have that J is 7 and 7 each away from G and H, then that means this is the bisector. Therefore, this is also 42 degrees. That's it. That's how you use that. Okay, number five, again, if you know these are bisected because they're both marked the same and you know these are perpendicular, then these are equal. So you know that SP is equal to SR, which means you can substitute those equations. You're going to take away 5x from both sides. We'll get x, and I'm going to add 5 to both sides to get 5 over here. And then I'm going to answer the question, which is find RS. This is RS. So if x is 5, this is 25. And that's the answer that I box or circle or put in the computer. And last we have um, find the measure of ABC. When AD is 3.2, CD is 3.2, and the measure of DBC equals 39. So we're given that these are both 
3.2. We know it's perpendicular and we know that DBC is 39 degrees. So because it meets all the requirements, that means this is also 39 degrees and it's asking me to find A, B, C, the big angle. So that means that the measure of angle ABC is 2 times 39, or 78 degrees. Again, always answer what is being asked, okay, not necessarily just your X. Okay, so any questions right now? Because we're not anywhere near done. Okay, we have a whole nother page. And this other page has to do with, uh, you've seen it already in both algebra and in geometry, in like chapter one. So I'm going to move this over here and go to this. It's a, you'll notice it's the third page from um, our notes. So here's what it says, write an equation of the perpendicular bisector of the segment with endpoints negative 2, 3 and 4, 1. So perpendicular bisector. So if we're going to do this, which is section 1, there's two things we need to get for sure. We need to find the perpendicular and we need to find the bisector. So you know, if I was talking to myself, okay, why do I need to find these things? Okay, so this is uh, the three steps here. First, we're going to find the midpoint. Why do we have to find the midpoint? Well, it's because this is a bisector. Because um, the bisector cuts the segment at the midpoint. Okay, the bisector cuts it at the midpoint. That's what bisect means. So we're going to find that midpoint. We have a formula for it. If you don't remember it, basically what you're doing is you're adding the x's together and then dividing by 2. So it's x1 plus x2. We're going to divide it. And then your second coordinate will be the y's. You add the y's together and you divide by 2. So here we're going to pop these numbers in. I'll just take the first ones here and the second ones there. So it'll be um, negative 2 plus 4 over 2. And then my y's will be 3 plus 1 over 2. And so that'll give me 2 divided by 2. This point will be 1. And this point will be 4 divided by 2, and that's 2. So this is my midpoint. Keep that in mind. That's what I will use for my bisector. Second, find the slope of the, orig of the original. Why do we have to find the slope? Okay. You need the slope because perpendicular lines can are, are uh, the negative reciprocal slope. So um, you need perpendicular lines. So you can use, I'm really abbreviating here. Um, You want the perpendicular slope to PQ. Okay, you were given PQ, but you have to find that slope. So this is slightly different. We use a small m for the slope. You remember it's the rise over the run, so it's going to be y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. Now you can pick either one of these to be 1 or 2. That doesn't matter as long as you don't swap them. So I always choose the first one to be 1 and the second one to be 2. So I'm going to do 1 minus 3 on the top. And then I'm going to do 4 minus negative 2 on the bottom. 
this is going to be negative 2, and this here is going to be 6. So I will reduce it by 2, and that's going to be negative 1 third. Okay, so that is the original slope. And then, of course, in order to use it for the perpendicular, I need to find the slope of the segment that's perpendicular. So that's like step three. Remember that the definition of perpendicular means that the product of the slopes of both lines that go like this, the product is negative one, which you can also think of as negative reciprocal. Okay, sometimes some people like thinking about that, but the way it works out is that this times the other slope, which I'm going to say is the slope of the perpendicular, that's a little, is equal to negative one. We'll just write that little formula. If you multiply both sides times negative one third, you get that the perpendicular slope is a positive three. So this is my perpendicular slope, which means if I want to write it now, and we did this both in algebra and in geometry earlier, there's two different ways we can write it. We've got the point slope formula. Let me zoom in again. And we have the slope intercept form. You can do either one. So it's y minus y sub 1 equals the slope times x minus x sub 1. That is the point slope because it uses the point and the slope. Slope intercept is slightly different. It's y equals mx plus b where you have the slope and the intercept. You'll get the same answer both ways, so we'll do it both ways. Okay, so here's the, the point you're going to use is 1, 2. The slope you're going to use is 3. So let's plug those in. It's going to be y minus 2 equals 3 times x minus 1. Again, you're using this midpoint and this slope. So then we're going to distribute the 3. And you're going to add 2 to both sides. And you get minus 1. So there's my slope for that one. This one, you have the slope of 3, and then you've got your point 1, 2. So you just put in 2 for y and 1 for x. So 2 equals, the slope is 3, 1. That's your 1, 2. And then you solve for b before you can write it. So this is 2 equals 3 plus b. If you take away 3 from both sides, you get negative 1 equals b. And then you can write y equals 3x minus 1. That's how it goes directly there. So you can see clearly we get the same thing. You just have to figure out which one you like best, or maybe it's which one you remember that day if you don't want to memorize it. And so the last thing we're going to do is graph it, which you will be required to do. So first, I'm going to put PQ on there. So PQ is negative 2, 3. There's P. And Q is 4, 1. So 4, 1 goes over here. We are scholars, so we always use our straight edge. And then our midpoint, we know, is 1, 2 from up here. So 1, 2 is going to be our midpoint. I'm just going to label that M. So if I now want to graph this one. Of course, I'm going to use green. Make sure it's color-coded. Then remember, I start at negative 1 on the y-axis, and then I count a slope of 3 up and 1 over. So I start here at negative 1 on the y. I'm going to go 1, 2, 3, and 1 over, 1, 2, 3, and 1 over, 1, 2, 3, and 1 over. Or, alternately, you could do 3 down and back 1, 3 down and back 1. And voila, y voila, we have a line. It looks perfectly perpendicular 
and beautiful. And there you go. That's what you have. Of course, big ideas will make it a little easier for you. And then what we'll do um, now that we've done this is tomorrow we will do this other one together with review. OK, so we'll try to make sure that sinks in and then we will do. Um, like I said, we'll finish those notes, the, the proof, and then we'll go over the chapter five quiz and um, you'll have the option to retake or get more class time to work on big ideas. So at this point, 